This morning's second reading is from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather girdle around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then when he then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions of the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit that re- benefits, befits repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His widowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather wheat into his granary, but the chafe he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word word of the Lord. Rejoice and be glad in it. Thanks be to God. We are continuing our Advent journey, and looking at all of these beautiful things, right? Each Sunday of peace and hope and love and joy and all of these things that we want um, for us, for our families, and for our world. And then we come to these really difficult passages of John the Baptist and winnowing forks and axe being at trees. And there's a lot. It'd be much more fun to skip to the warm and fuzzy, but we all know from our own lives There's much more going on in these weeks as we wait for Christ's coming and in our world. There is evil and that there are hard things. And both are a reality. And so as we look to this Sunday of hope, we engage in a faithful practice of hope, not by ignoring or diminishing the pain and the evil that is present, by but by being able to also speak and name a different reality that does exist alongside and to have that reality speak a word of hope into the pain and into the justice that we experience and that we confront. Our scriptures come from very troubled times. This passage from Isaiah is um, during... The split of the two kingdoms, so Israel is divided. We have the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And anyone who has two siblings in their family um, knows the kind of rivalry and fighting and drama and mess that goes on. And if you could just think about that at a national scale, you pretty much got the context and situation. And so Israel has tried to get Judah to be with them in a rebellion against Assyria with other nations. Judah didn't want to, so Israel came to try to bully them um, with other nations into. They fought that battle, but then they went and tattletailed on Assyria, who's basically the parent of the region, that that's what they were doing, which then led to the parent coming down. This is not good parenting technique. This is where the metaphor breaks down, Um, taking over Israel um, and putting them into exile. Um, So That hasn't happened yet, but the tattletaling has happened, and it's just a mess. Um, And there is not a lot of peace. But yet even and especially in the midst of that kind of turmoil, 
comes this hope from the prophet Isaiah, a hope for justice and a hope for peace. And I think it's important to note that the justice does not come from us. It comes from the spirit of God resting upon us. And for Isaiah, that was a leader, probably Hezekiah. We don't know for sure. Um, but there's a reason that the followers of Christ centuries later saw in that prophecy and the spirit of God resting upon this leader who they had found in Jesus Christ and was able to read this prophecy written so many years earlier and find in it their truth and their hope that they had found in Christ the Messiah. And if we fast forward those years to the coming of Christ and John the Baptist preparing the way, we know that there's just a whole nother round of mess going on. This is an occupied people. There's a Roman power ruling um, in their land. And so you have to decide what you do with your power. So you have the zealots who are fighting against it. You have the tax collectors who are using it for their financial gain. You have the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that are named, who have made a way of purification and of following laws in order to preserve their cultural and religious identity. The problem is that following and those rituals and purification rules are so strict that it set up a whole nother class of elites um, who are able to follow those rules and those the majority who are not and so a bit of that anger burns through when you have them coming to john the baptist in the wilderness and him um, calling them basically an sob that would be the modern equivalent of brood of vipers um, there's also an interesting thing with the Greek in that we think, why is John the Baptist reacting so strongly at this point? They were coming out for baptism. Well, that Greek preposition can also be translated against um, and coming against the movement that was happening that was making repentance and making baptism available to many more people than the way of purification um, had opened up to. But that's getting stuck in another sermon for another day. There's lots happening um, in these passages. But what I want to look at is being in wilderness um, and the pain and the loneliness um, of wilderness time, but also the beauty and the gift of wilderness time. This is where the Israelites were wandering after being rescued from slavery in Egypt. And it's where they were murmuring and grumbling against God and wanting to go back because it was so hard. But it's also where God's covenant and commandments were given and where they learned to trust and follow that. And for John the Baptist, wilderness is where a new beginning, something is being created, something different and there's a reason people are flooding to it to see what is happening. Wilderness is where we witness. Wilderness is where we are healed. Wilderness is the most powerful place for us and for our faith journeys. It's where we take all of the wounds and all of the pains and all of the lament we have and it's where God tumbles those over, and it's where the transformation work happens. So that once, what once damaged us and caused us to break now becomes our center and our foundation and our power and our strength. It's what once was done to us becomes something that is a wound that can heal, that we can work from to heal others. This is the place where witness and beautiful gifts can happen if we grow together. In coming to these texts and being in wilderness um, is not an easy story to take on. We have a picture here of a tree um, that is here on our grounds. So Mike, you're not allowed to leave for a while so people can find it because if you find Mike's red truck that's parked right in that thrifty penny parking lot, right in front of this truck um, by the stone steps that are coming off of Warren Road is the tree that we're talking about. 
Um, so as you can see, the stump is kind of crumbling now and the leaves are around it. But this was a really big tree that died, right? And we have our own scripture of out of the stump of Jesse shall come a shoot. Well, we don't have just a shoot here at Epworth. Mm -mm. That little bit of hope is not enough for this family. We need our own freaking tree in the middle of the tree in the way that we do life and that we do faith. Look at this thing. If you look at it, it looks like a big regular tree that you would see that's been planted. It grew out of the middle of this stump out of the middle of this wilderness, out of the middle of this place that most of us would see as finished and as done and not a lot of hope for growth. But yet here is our very own miracle and witness to faith on our very family grounds. And so part of what I want to talk about is where we find that hope and how we practice staying open. Because there is real pain and there is real danger, but there's also real possibility. I'm in dog world right now because Abraham and I are three, month, three weeks in to a brand new adoption. And it's a tiny little Shih Tzu thing that has stolen our hearts with how ridiculously cute it is. We basically have a live stuffed animal now as a part of our family, and it's fantastic. Um, so we took him home over Thanksgiving um, vacation, and my sister has three dogs, two really big ones, German Shepherd mixes, and then a tiny little Boston Terrier. Now, we go and we visit with my sister, and all I can hear is the vet's words in my head in the very first visit that I made, and we're nervous. This is the first time we've owned a dog. And the vet's like, oh, you can't have a collar. You need a harness because this is a little dog, and one bite from a big dog is all it takes. And so you need a harness so that if something happens, you can grab your dog and save him um, without hurting him and yanking him away. So now here we go to meeting my sister's two big German shepherds. Like, that's not nerve-wracking at all, right? Um, one bite, that's all it takes. You know, you hear those tapes playing again and again in your head. And then it turns out, as I'm talking with my sister to prepare for this, her dog has bitten Sophie, the little dog, and sent her to the vet. Um, so we've decided that Sis is going to be cornered off because Sis isn't ready yet. Um, but she thinks it'll be fine with Scoot, with the other big German Shepherd. Well, it's not only fine. Um, we went over there to wear Olaf out playing with Sophie so that we could have a nice drive back home. Um, but Scoot decided that Olaf was too small and needed protection. And so Scoot spent the entire time with Olaf standing over him. Now, th this little 10-pound Shih Tzu fits perfectly right underneath this big German Shepherd. So they're paired up, and he's just drooling on our bulldog. He's soaked. Um, but there's no biting. It's just, you know, a whole bath time. Um, and, and Scoot won't even let Sophie near Olaf because Scoot has decided that Sophie plays too fiercely for Olaf and he's going to protect Olaf from Sophie. Um, so if you have an image of this peaceable kingdom, right, what does it look like for that lion to be standing over the lamb and protecting the lamb? But still, as wonderful and as adorable as it was once we got past the drool, um, we had to put Scoot away too um, because we needed Olaf to play and wear out. And although Olaf was small, he, he was able to take care of himself um, and play with Sophie. And so part of growing together is finding space with the big dogs um, that aren't all dangerous or something that we need to fear. But it's also finding space within the protection that Olaf and the others who are smaller can grow and can find their own strength and their own selves um, to take in play or protect themselves. So what if this peaceable kingdom and growing together isn't just the warm fuzzy of everyone lying down together? What if it's everyone teaching each other? So the cat is teaching the lion how to purr, and the lion is teaching the lamb how to roar. 
and the dog is teaching the wolf how to wag its tail, and the wolf is teaching the young calf how to bear its teeth and how to protect itself. What if we are all sharing our best traits and balancing them in a way that we are able to bring hope and bring possibility that didn't exist before? There's a quote that I love that says, all creation involves danger because creation relies on the untried. Jesus' movement is of disciples who are fighting against the Roman Empire, the zealots, and tax collectors who are working for. Now, We know there were plenty of other tax collectors and plenty of other zealots who did not join Jesus' movement and were not a part of the disciples. But we know of 12 who did. And so part of our Advent hope and part of our Advent work is to step into the danger of wilderness so that the creation of what has not been tried before has a chance to take root so that we have a chance for the impossible to be made possible, to trust that not all the big dogs are going to be ready to bite the little dogs, and to trust that even when we want to protect and save each other from experiencing pain or danger, that there are other ways, too, to help us learn our own power and be able to share that in a way that we can all grow together, in a way for a movement of hope to be created and to be born. This doesn't come from us. This comes from the Spirit of God resting on us. So just like Mike found and pointed this tree to me of what is growing and what is happening, who can we point to in our family? that we know the Spirit of God is resting on them and that they have a word for us of what remains untried in our family, a challenge for us to be part of creating and growing together so that a movement of hope might be born here this Advent season. Amen.